Good morning. Welcome to the beautiful Savior. Welcome to our worship today, and thank you for being here. My name is Pastor Andrew Miller. I want to welcome all of you to worship, and welcome all those who will be watching online later today or this week as well. We are starting a new but a very brief sermon series called Family Values, and the idea here is to bridge the season of Epiphany with the season of Lent, and just to take a little stopgap type of series to talk about values of our Christian church family and values that overlap into our Christian family or our home lives as well. Our order of service is found on this service sheet. If you're watching online, you can download this PDF and use it to help follow along with, on, with what's on the screen. And you can do the same in person. Fo- use this to follow along the outline of our worship, and you can also rely on the screen behind me. With that, let's open with him 354, Lamb of God, we fall before you, and may God bless your worship. Begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. So hear the word of Christ Jesus through his called servant. I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join in prayer. Holy Redeemer, by your authority, hearts are one. By your authority, faith is strengthened. By your authority, the devil and his plans are defeated. Bring our family, both at home and at church, to love and honor your authority. Help us to rely on your will to guide our decisions and to resolve our differences. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Let's say that you're attending a Super Bowl party, and you know that one of your friends there struggles mightily with alcohol. But you know as a Christian, you have the liberty, the freedom, to enjoy an alcoholic beverage. Nothing wrong with it. Will you or will you not partake? Well, what the Apostle Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through through 13, is that there are occasions in a Christian's life where we have perfect freedom to do stuff, whatever it might be. In this case, eating food that was designated to be sacrificed for idols. 
But in some cases, for the good of other people's Christian faith or conscience, we will willfully abstain, we will not use our Christian freedom, even though we could, because we're concerned about someone else's maturity of faith, okay, or sensitivity in faith. Let's take a look at this example to learn more. Paul wrote, now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. In other words, Paul is saying, we know what the truth is. Verse 5, for even if there are so-called gods with a lowercase g, there aren't, but even if there were, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many quote-unquote gods and many quote-unquote lords, yet for us, that is for believers, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as have been, having been sacrificed to a false god. And since their conscience is weak, it's defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. In other words, it doesn't matter with regard to our relationship with God. It matters in regard to our relationship to people. Okay? Be careful, however, verse 9, that the exercise of your rights, that is your freedom as a Christian, does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? And so this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. In other words, their faith is seriously damaged. When you sin against them in this way and you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. This is the word of God. Our sermon hymn is called Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. Christ, the church's head. 
the church's authority. Amen. Our sermon text is based on the gospel, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel. It all started with a game of hide-and-go-seek. Some of you got to meet my father a week or two ago when he and my mother visited for a week, and he stepped into the pulpit for a Sunday, so you got to, to meet Wayne Miller. Well, Wayne Miller, my dad, served, had the privilege of serving for about seven years as a professor at our church body seminary in and around Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the 1980s. Those were formative years while I was growing up, and so I want to show you a little bit about the context of the seminary so that you can sort of paint a picture in your mind for what I'm about to share with you. But if you'll take a look, this is a historical photo of our seminary, and you can see that it was built along the same lines of the architecture of the Wartburg Castle in Wartburg, Germany. That was the castle where Martin Luther, during the Middle Ages, was isolated and secluded under protective care so that he wouldn't be caught or apprehended and persecuted for his teachings. But while in isolation and seclusion in the Wartburg Castle of Germany, Martin Luther translated the Bible from the original languages to German so that the German laity, the people, believers, could actually read the word of God for themselves. And that was not something commonly done at that time. The invention of the printing press helped that initiative along and provided a great service to the Christian church. By the way, incidentally, that's why the Lutheran church, as an example, is very uh, heavy on emphasizing your relationship personally to the word of God because that was the spark of the original Reformation in the first place. In any case, our seminary was patterned after that Wartburg Castle. And if you take a look at the next photo, you can see an updated version of the seminary. It's a beautiful campus. And this is the main archway at the front entrance. You can go under the archway, and inside you'll see a courtyard. And in this aerial photo, you'll see that it's shaped kind of like a horseshoe. On the top or the left side of the horseshoe, you have dormitories for those students who stay on campus. And in the front and to the bottom right, go back to that last photo for a second. On the front and bottom right, you have administrative offices and classrooms. And then that, that, built, that square building on the right there is the library. Okay? Well, this horseshoe type pattern, you can see the courtyard in the middle, has evolved a little bit since I've been there. Here's a picture of the you know, just a beautiful scenery picture from the courtyard. Of course, it looks different today because right now as we're speaking, there are 47 feet, inches of snow on the ground, you know. So they're probably buried there. In any case, uh, you'll see in this next picture too, this courtyard, they've remodeled this or added this since I grew up there. But when I was growing up on the seminary campus, in the fall of 1989, we played hide-and-go-seek with fellow PKs or pastors or professors' kids, a little cadre of us in the center court, and there were bushes that lined the center circle, which made for actually pretty good hiding spots. So I niched myself in beneath one of these bushes and had a great hiding spot, but no one found me during the course of the game. And afterwards, we got into some kind of kid-like squabble about the game and who won and all this stuff. And in the midst of the squabble, 
there was a senior class seminary student who was walking through the courtyard here. I'm not sure where he was going, but, and I'm not sure how this happened, but uncharacteristically of me, I said something smart alecky to him. Okay, well, he took issue, picked me up. I'm about a nine year old kid. And he said, Ah, Wayne Miller's boy. Let's walk you down to your dad's house or to your house and see how your dad feels about how you're talking to me. I was not excited about that idea. So he's carrying me, and I can't rest free from him, and I'm squirming like a fish in his arms and kind of badgering him to let me down. And finally, he gets me to the front sidewalk steps of our house, and he negotiated some truce. I'm not sure what the terms were, but like a little, when he let me down, I spit in his face and ran as far away from him as I could. I'm telling you, this is why my parents claim that I was born with a double dose of original sin. In any case, I don't believe I'm the only one. In fact, I know I'm not the only one who has from time to time had an issue with authority. We all take issue with authority or authorities from time to time, don't we? If you doubt what I'm saying, ask yourself if it's ever happened that you got pulled over and while the police officer was determining whether to or actually writing your ticket, you were conjuring up the way to question him or to get off without one. If you doubt what I'm saying, then ask how many, how, how many times have you sincerely gone to the throne of God's grace with genuine, gracious words to God about the life, faith, or spirituality of a politician with whom you disagree. How many times have you sincerely prayed to God with thanks for the teacher who corrected you in front of the class? The spouse who rebuked you in front of the kids? Or the boss who gave you a directive that... <clears throat> You didn't like, you didn't want. We all take issue with authority. We squirm and try to wrest ourselves away from the grip of authority. It's not uncommon. In fact, it is common. It's human. It's one thing, though, to have a confrontation with human authorities. It's a whole other issue a deep and problematic spiritual issue to take issue with God's authority. This little sermon series called Family Values is just a bridge between the season of Epiphany and the season of Lent in the church calendar year. And we might revisit this theme or this series throughout the course of the year if we ever have another little window of time to do so. Nevertheless, it's important that we consider what are some of the virtues, some of the values of not just our Christian church or church families, uh, of our church family at Beautiful Savior, but what are some of the virtues that characterize our family at home as believers in Christ? I'll tell you, one of them, biblically at least, is that we value authority so long as those human authorities that have been delegated their power from God don't ever challenge us to do or believe something that contradicts the will of God. But above any authority, God is regarded by us as having ultimate power, ultimate say, the first and the last word. Why? Well, first of all, because we know that historically God has proven the validity and the strength of his authority in time. Just rewind a little bit, if you will, through Old Testament history and take just some of the the big and prominent prominent examples. God demonstrated the the weight and the 
power of his authority in creation when he spoke a word and what wasn't came to be. God demonstrated his power over time by establishing the boundaries of it. God, God demonstrated his authority over people and, the na and nature itself with the flood and Noah, his family, and those who denied Christ through all those years of Noah's preaching. God demonstrated his power and authority over people who would oppose him, not just in the flood, but when he delegated authority to Moses to go in and confront Pharaoh about how he was persecuting God's people, Pharaoh said, no thanks, don't believe him, don't care, shook his fist in God's face, although it was Moses, it was really God's authority, and God showed his authority by implementing and executing the ten plagues, right? Over time, God showed it again in a different kind of way. He showed that he had authority even over spiritual beings because in the Psalms, he says that he commands his angels concerning us to serve, to guard us in all our ways. God has ultimate authority. It's reflected in the Old Testament words of the Bible. It's also reflected in the New. In New Testament times, too, God has promised in Ephesians that he still reigns over all, controlling all things on planet Earth, orchestrating, not necessarily always what he wants, but overseeing and st still kind of like the puppet master over all things on planet earth for the good of his church. In other words, his people. That's not easy for me to remember. It's not a, a good, it's not a, a promise I often flee to when I'm reading the news headlines. In fact, it's, it's really easy for me to forget, but even by doing so, it's it's me forgetting about the authority that God promises me he still has. But there's more. God promises that there's going to come a time where he sends his angels to the four corners of the earth, every corner, and he's going to delegate to his angels the power and authority to harvest, to gather to himself those who believe and to separate from him for all eternity those who don't. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth until the end of time. But you can, you can see, also reflected, a little ounce of Jesus' authority just in Mark chapter 1 right here. We typically refer to this section of the Gospels as the occasion where Jesus drives out an evil spirit. And he did do that. It was a miracle to be sure. A demon... The demon in this context only cowers at the almighty word of God. Jesus spoke and the demon submitted. But that wasn't the first miracle of Jesus in context, was it? Did you catch the first miracle? Listen. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were so amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. Look at this. The people were amazed. It was as though they had heard or seen a miracle, but what caused the amazement? What mesmerized them? What gripped their hearts and minds? It was his teaching. And when did the demon wake up? It's as though the, the devil was sleeping on this guy. The demon was just sort of like, you know, relaxing in the easy chair and watching the Super Bowl. And all of a sudden he noticed, wait, hearts and minds are being influenced by the power of the gospel. And red alert, red alert, I better get who, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. Do you see? The demon only wakes up when the power of Jesus' word is at work. Can't you see, can't you tell that when God uses his words, his promises on your heart and mind to effect change, to mature your faith, to maybe give you a more discerning, a more mature view of human authorities at every level, that's when the devil's going to attack you the most. The devil doesn't want your intimacy with Jesus and his promises to develop, to deepen. He wants you to drift and to float away. 
And so if the devil, if one of his minions sees that you're in the word of God, you're in the promises of God, you're really fleeing to God in word and prayer on a regular basis because of the world we live in, because of what's going on at home in your life, what's he going to do? He's going to intensify the attacks, not stand down. The weight of Jesus' authority is focalized, it's localized in his word, his teaching, the gospel. What did the Apostle Paul say to the Romans? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the, to bring salvation to those who believe. Faith comes from hearing the message, not from some big, brazen earth-shattering miracle. The message is heard through the word of Christ. The full weight of Jesus' authority is all packed into the power of his word and the gospel especially. But just because I say that, I know it sounds pastory and preachy, you'd, have, you'd expect me to say it maybe, but don't let that fool you into thinking that just because that's where Jesus' authority lies, that you're just going to be okay with it all the time. We don't love authority. We don't cherish. We, we chafe against authority. We'd rather be our own bosses when the answer to the question, who's in charge, isn't, well, it's me, then we immediately, immediately, the process of criticizing of nitpicking, of quibbling, of spitballing, it starts right away. Which, by the way, as a side note, if you find yourself in a place or position of authority, parent, pastor, teacher, professor, friend, principal, boss, manager, volunteer coordinator, if you have delegated by God to you some measure of authority, you should expect to get gruff, right? Because human beings don't relish authority. But you should know that Jesus doesn't cherish people who disregard and disrespect authority either. How did God handle the whiners and complainers who came out of Egypt and the persecution of Pharaoh and started whining and complaining against Moses and Aaron? You remember? How did God allow Absalom's life to play out? Absalom, the son of David, who chronically, contemptuously conspired against his own father, David the king. How'd that work out? Why did Jesus use the same pointed tone to Pharisees that he used to demons? It's because first and foremost, God damns the disrespectful, he condemns the contemptuous, he banishes those who blaspheme his authority or his delegates. That's where it begins. But Jesus never does any of those things before he assures you that he has died for the dishonorable. The most important way that Jesus demonstrated or exercised his authority, his divine authority, was in his life and his death, wasn't it? Think about it. How can you be sure that you're not going to be thrown into some eternal prison for all the times that you have broken the fourth commandment? For as much as you have neglected the word of God or the Sabbath day in your life. How can you be sure? Isn't it because you know that Jesus crucified your sins to that cross and anything that you have ever done wrong, ever, has been buried with Christ in death? How can you be sure that you're going to live after death, that you're going to survive judgment day and with joy and excitement even after all the secret sins and all the... Uh, isn't it because Jesus exercised his greatest authority over the curse when he conquered the tomb, when he rose from death? Jesus, think about this, set aside the highest authority 
only to submit himself below the most corrupt human authority. And he did it silently without an untoward word. And when it was all over, he endured the punishment of corrupt people, death for your forgiveness. And he turned around and like a champion, rose over death, back to life, ascended into heaven, and not so that he could arrogantly, you know, sort of tighten the knot of the tie and say, see, you should all just follow my example better. But rather to share with you the victory, to declare with you that you are the champion he is, and furthermore, to delegate to you his authority. Who has authority over death now? Who is stronger than the devil now? Who has the will and the fortitude to resist temptation and the devil and his demons when they're on high alert? You do. Because you are beholden to the gospel. 2012, I've told you this before, but that's when I accepted, in October of 2012, the call to serve beautiful Savior. While I was on the phone with Pastor Peter Kruschel, deliberating that call and discussing with him some of the logistics and administrative things, I asked him, so who's the president, by chance, of the Arizona-California district of our church body? The re- this region, we have administrative authorities who serve and pastor churches in their territory. And he said, oh, it's, it's uh, John Bucholtz. And I said, oh, you don't say. Because John Bucholtz graduated from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in 1990, just about six months re- removed from the fall of 1989 when he had an, an, an encounter with a nine-year-old seminary professor's kid <clears throat> who projected his own saliva to his face and got away with it because he didn't catch me. (laughs) And I don't know that my dad ever found out either, but who knows. But now let me tell you this. This is not a what goes around comes around kind of story. We're Christians. We're not my name is Earl kind of karma people, okay? But there are two important lessons to take away from this true story. First of all, had I obeyed authority the first time, then later on, when I met my authority face to face, I would have had nothing to be ashamed about. Think about Jesus' authority and who he's delegated it to. If you'll just look at the gospel and obey it now, then when you meet Jesus, you'll be able to stand, with, stand before him face to face with a clear conscience, won't you? But secondly, here's, and maybe most importantly, doesn't it tell you, this little anecdote, that the greatest exercise, the greatest word of authority is the forgiving word. The authority figures who exercise their power to restore relationships, to restore laughter, to replace bitterness. The greatest exercise of authority that my district president has shown me in the eight years that I've been in this district is by not exacting revenge by not giving me what I truly deserve. Isn't that a true picture of our Savior? Jesus does not treat us how we deserve, even after we've trampled upon the fourth commandment or the third or any other one. So since you know that, since you have the ultimate authority who loves you so, When Jesus speaks from now on, and no matter what he says, how about you listen? When Jesus teaches, how about you open your eyes and your mouth and marvel? 
when God's word or when God's messenger, be it a pastor, a teacher, Sunday school teacher, school director, a Christian friend, a spouse, when they rebuke or correct you with the help of the word of God, how about you absorb it with your defenses down? Don't run away. Don't ostracize and ignore because you're bitter or you're mad. If you've been struggling, which we all do, with human authorities, it's time to revisit the ultimate authority and ask him for strength and perspective. But then again, total this all up, and if you fail... Before Jesus comes again, when you fail, because we will, then just remember what the greatest exercise of Jesus' authority was and is. You are forgiven. You are his precious child. And even after you've sinned, he will only restore, he will never treat you as your sins really deserve. That's Jesus That's why we make his authority our priority. Amen. The peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds by faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please join me in confessing your faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Now would be a good time to consider your offering, and to complete the connection card that is located nearby where you're sitting. O Lord God, we thank you for the wondrous gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, for his divine and gracious authority, for the promised graces we have received as blessings through him. We thank you that through his perfect life and obedience to death on the cross, we have been granted cleansing and forgiveness for all of our sins. We thank you that in his resurrection, we have the promise of life everlasting and authority from him to conquer death. And that in his ascension to the right hand of your majesty in heaven, Jesus provides assurance that he is still actively right now continually interceding for the good of his people. Help us to believe and trust in Christ, to love and serve him, so that all our thoughts, words, and actions will show themselves and reflect the Holy Spirit. Rebuke and restrain our selfishness, subdue our self-indulgence, deepen our sympathies for others, strengthen our hope in Christ, and confirm us in our Christian faith. Dwell in our homes too, O Lord, so that the trust of our families will always be centered on you alone, and so that no difficulty, no hardship or trouble or adversity 
will ever rob us of the conviction that you help us in our time of need. Relieve, if you will, the suffering of the weary and the sick. Please dry the tears of the troubled and sorrowful. Lead us all to look to you as the unfailing wellspring of healing and hope. Now, Lord, please hear us as we also bring you our private prayers. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with prayer and our blessing. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have shared with us in our eating and drinking of the sacrament. Through this gift, you have proclaimed forgiveness, fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is called, How Precious is the Book Divine. Welcome again. Thank you again for being with us, a beautiful Savior. I uh, have a couple of announcements for you. First of all, the Lent season is not far away. Ash Wednesday is Wednesday night, February 17th, and we are going to be having midweek Lenten services this year, but with a couple of differences from years past. First of all, remember that the time is 6.30 p.m. for midweek services, 6.30 p.m., Services are about 40 minutes long for your planning. 
If you're thinking about bringing kids, just know it'll be about 7.15, 7.30 before you get home. We will not be doing the local pastor rotation this year because of the current conditions. And we will also not be providing the soup suppers like we have in the past as well. So we're still not getting back to the full fellowship time. But we will worship. Now, also on Ash Wednesday, we're not going to, we're going to forego the laying on of ashes this year. We will serve the Lord's Supper, but no, no ashes, all right? Uh, some highlights, though, of the Lenten season for you. First of all, on Ash Wednesday, we're going to welcome the Branches Band. Branches Band is a, one of our church body's sort of traveling musical uh, teams, okay? And uh, they're, they're, really, they're really gifted people. If you were at any point engaged with our pre-recorded worship services earlier on in the phase of COVID, then you might have heard some of their music in those recordings on YouTube. You'll recognize some of their stuff because I've asked them to, do some, to use some songs that I used during this, this time period. So come and enjoy. That'll be a highlight of worship on Ash Wednesday. Then, during Holy Week this year, we're welcoming a man named Chris Dreisbach. Chris Dreisbach is a, more of a solo show and, uh, or a solo musician. He, his music may not be as familiar to you, but he, too, is very, very gifted. He'll be with us during Holy Week, and he'll be playing for, more than, he'll be playing for a few different services. Okay? So there's some, some fun highlights to look forward to. We're hoping and praying that the Lenten season will be for you substantive, and you'll get to enjoy a little bit of creativity and worship as well. To that point, during the Lenten season, the schedule for our spiritual growth is likely to change just a little bit. We're not quite sure yet how we're going to handle it because we're, we're due also to hear some updates in the news about capacities for worship too. So wait about a week, maybe a week and a half, and then look for announcements about what changes might take place for our worship schedules and our adult spiritual growth schedules. For this week, everything's the same. There's Tuesday catechism, Wednesday adult Bible study in the book of Revelation, morning and evening, and Thursday Bible 101, okay? So same schedule this week, but the week after when Lent starts, likely some changes. That's all I had for you. Otherwise, thank you very much. Enjoy the Super Bowl today, and God's grace be with you this week.